Boom, boom, boom. It's mind pump time. All right, welcome back to the best fitness and health and entertainment podcast in the world. Today's episode is awesome. It's all about physical therapy. How do you know if you need it? What value do you get? And also, we introduce a new physical therapy technology. It's disrupting the market. Really cool episode, but I know why you're here. You want some free stuff. Here's what we're giving away today. Free access to Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, you win free access to those two programs. Also, there's only four days left for our 50% off sale, Maps Performance and Maps Suspension. Go find them at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just don't forget to use the code SEPTEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Let's start with just physical therapy and just define it. Like, what is physical therapy? What's the goal of physical therapy? Um, great question, Sal. So, uh, fundamentally, physical therapy is um, defined as therapists who are movement specialists. So, physical therapy is a program that is covered by insurance. Of course, it's a health care provision to ensure that you have received care to recover and bring you back to functional activity. However, the definition of physical therapy, physical therapists is changing. So physical therapists, you would go to a physical therapist if you are injured, if you're hurt, you need to get better from something. And most of the time you procrastinate on that because you don't know if you're hurt enough to actually go to physical therapy, <laughs> right? So physical therapists, if you think about them as movement specialists, musculoskeletal injuries is one of the most common you know, healthcare expenditures and the largest healthcare expenditures. So physical therapy truly can be taken a look as uh, primary care, can be taken a look as rehabilitative, post-rehabilitative, pre-rehabilitative. So there are a lot of times when physical therapy is what a, what a patient needs or what a person needs. And I think that definition is not very clear to everybody. Yeah, well, does it now, okay, so let's say uh, somebody goes to a physical therapist because they've injured themselves. Mm -hmm. Is the goal to get them to move without pain or is the goal to get them to move the way they did before they hurt themselves, because those are two different things, right? Absolutely. I think that the most important thing is to understand as a therapist, what is the right movement? What is the right um, ability for your muscles to recover? Why you're having pain? Is it because you're not moving right or are you moving less? Are you moving more? And hence an assessment, a thorough assessment of understanding what is the problem? What is the cause before you actually jump right into the pain area is the most important thing. So as a physical therapist, we're never treating the pain. We're treating the cause. Mm. And identifying the cause is why we have an initial evaluation. The first visit, a lot of our patients are telling us, okay, but we didn't really do any treatment today. And that's <laughs> because, you know, there's some science behind this. We're actually spending all this time just trying to understand, um, do we need to move you through that pain or do we need to actually train something mm -hmm. else so that as soon as you train something else, your pain's actually going to be better by not doing anything where the pain area was. You know, you just... It's actually fantastic. You just hit on something that we we tell the our audience how to identify a good personal trainer or a bad one. And that is if the first session is mostly assessing and no working out, you've probably got a good trainer. If your trainer, the first day you see them, gets you into a workout right away, you know you probably have a yeah. bad trainer. Yeah, and what you were saying, you know, I, just to, I'm gonna kind of close that loop a little bit, is, you know, sometimes your knee pain, because I think a lot of people, for example, I'll just use the knee, your knee hurts, and so you think, something's wrong with my knee. It's my knee that hurts, therefore, it's my knee that gets needs to get fixed. Whereas oftentimes it has nothing to do with the knee. It has a lot to do with, I don't know, the ankle or the foot or the hip or maybe the ankle on the other side of the body. In other words, the root cause of the knee pain is not the knee itself. And I think that's what you mean by not treating the pain, but rather try treating the, the cause. Absolutely. And I think knee pain, the second largest condition that physical therapy treats, yeah. right? I mean, if you're having pain inside your knee or underneath your kneecap, like why is it getting lo loaded more? Like what do we do hmm. when we are overworked? You know, we crash. We, we kind yeah. of are like, this is too much for me or get overwhelmed. And that's exactly what happens when we hurt. Our knee has loaded has been loaded more than it could handle. And we just got to figure out who is not doing the job. Let's go train that, that muscle. Oh, so, that, that, so knee pain would be like your number one in terms of people coming in. Number two. For number two, you yeah, said, she okay. said two. Yeah. two yeah. Uh, so is, is low back pain number one? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So okay. lower back pain. And of course, it depends. Even in physical therapy, we're trying to improve awareness. Patients don't know when to come in. And and so, yes, but, um, you know, based on analysis, lower back is definitely number one, the highest musculoskeletal condition treated um, and prevalence wise too. And knee pain definitely goes second in the active population. Um, that we're looking at now what 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 percentage would you attribute uh the rehab that you have to do is related to an acute injury versus somebody who has either chronic pain for years and then showed up or injured themselves because of poor movement patterns and that's why they're there yes oh my gosh i have percentage wise i think um i don't really have that on the top of my head but what's most important is there's specialty of these physical therapists so not every pt can treat an acute patient um, and acute injuries can be lots of different type, types. Like, did you actually fall and then yeah, your knee started hurting? Yeah. Or if you jammed your knee against something and that's why your knee started hurting versus, well, you just overloaded your knee doing really uh, heavy weight lifts and yeah. that loaded your knee. So I think there's that importance of understanding. But acute care in physical therapy can be after like an acute injury. And there's so much evidence that when we see our patients within 15 days or 20 days of being injured, um, their you know ability to recover is significantly high and that's the reason why today when you go to an urgent care for a low back pain oh my gosh I can't even straighten up we're really working as an industry in physical therapy to tell those urgent care physicians don't send them to your PCP please send them to physical therapy you're a doctor you can refer your patients let's not get them into this chain of being going from one doctor to another until they really are coming back to physical therapy when it's evidence based that it benefits your yeah the, the example I would give I used to get so I used to work a lot with physical therapists and, and the exam Examples I would give to kind of illustrate what we're saying, it's like, it's, and this is a simple example. It's, and it's, you know, it's funny, but it's kind of true. It's like you're banging your head against the wall and then you go to the doctor and you're like, my head hurts. And they say, well, here's some <laughs> ibuprofen. Whereas somebody who's looking at the root cause is going to look and say, okay, let's stop banging your head against the wall. And that's probably what's going to, you know, solve the problem. So you don't have to keep masking this particular issue. Another thing that's very interesting is, and you, in, this isn't so much of an issue now, but even with older generations, I worked a lot with people in advanced age. And a lot of times, you know, if you go back decades, when people had pain, it was because of overwork, hard labor. Nowadays, pain comes from inactivity often, right? Or poor, you know, movement patterns. And I think there's this kind of widely believed idea, which is a myth, that joints have uh, you know, a shelf life. If you use a joint too much, if you move it more, it's just going to get worse, which isn't necessarily mm. true. If you move it right, it actually gets healthier and it has a longer, it, it has even more longevity. Is this an issue you ever have to talk with patients about? And All the time. And in fact, I find two opportunities in what you said, Saul. Um, first was about, um, you know, the first is about this longevity of using your joints, right? Um, when you are using your joints, but if you're using it right, you have the right muscle balance and your body is able to handle that joint stress because you're training your body to do more. So if you're training your body to do more, you have the right muscle balance and you're doing an activity that's not unrealistic. Like, mm -hmm. of course, uh, you know, you don't really want to be doing something that's unrealistic for your body. Um, so if you're doing all of that, more activity is good, but you are wearing down when it's high impact. Mm. So there's a difference between impact exercises versus stabilization exercises. So what kind of exercise are you overdoing can be detrimental to your joints. Right, right. Um, so, so it definitely needs to be appropriate to the person. Absolutely. And yeah. appropriate to your cause of training. Right, right. So are you doing this? So you wouldn't want to do heavy weight lifts, um, which is burst of movements versus adherence exercises or endurance exercises that are high repetitive but are not high impact. Mm. Um, so what kind of exercises are you doing? To actually affect your joints is what I think every everybody can benefit from knowing. Like, yeah. am I doing box jumps that are, you know, impact exercises and doing them three sets of fifteen, or are we doing five sets of five? Oh, right. You just so, hit. You just hit one of our sweet spots. We love to just. <laughs> <laughs> do we hate box jumps with trainers. That's like one of the number one things. Nobody does them right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's, an, it's like a. And it, the wrong people are doing it. They have. They have my my lady who's. Yeah. 55 years old and 30 pounds overweight and she's doing 15 jump boxes. No, like that. exactly. Terrible person yeah. to be doing that. Very true. Size. So, but, oh, so I actually wanted to also hit this other thing which you mentioned which is we come from people who've been very active and are hurting to come 
you know, from pain coming from inactivity. But then we have this other category of people. Those are our weekend warriors, right? We're mm. inactive the entire week and we're like, okay, we're going to be out this entire weekend either hiking uphill or doing activities or doing two days in a row of personal training. I think that's another area where education becomes really important for a patient. So we all the time are addressing lifestyle, understanding where they come from. And we're going to get into Luna in a little bit, but that's exactly where having the opportunity to be in your patient's environment as compared to a patient actually coming into a clinic environment tells a therapist so much more to help them in a better I, way. I, I, go yeah. ahead. Oh yeah, I have a question about uh, pain. Like how how does that conversation look as a, a you know as a patient comes in and you know how can you actually talk them through in terms of like defining what type of pain it is and then you know like uh, be able to 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 bring that to a point of where they can understand you know like is this really something detrimental or is this something you know we can kind of work through sure i think that we as therapists um during our initial evaluation try to stay away from too much of a pain conversation. What we're actually trying to give them is insight into their own self. Mm. So when we do an evaluation, what we're about talking movement? about, yeah, where are you coming from? What was your prior level of function? Did this really start hurting five days ago or was this something that's been going on for three years? And if somebody is coming in with pain being there for three years, they're more focused on things that they cannot do because of that pain as compared to get my pain away. They're talking more about, I can't run. I have to give up on lifting up my kids. Or they're talking about things they're not doing. And that's where that mind psychology comes in. What is our patient's end goal? And this is not um, every therapist, right? And even for therapists, this is an important question, is at the end of our assessment, are we addressing their pain or are we addressing what they wanna really get back to? Mm -hmm. And working it towards that versus, Okay, let's fix your pain. You got to do these five exercises that take care of pain versus if you want to get back to lifting your kids without pain or putting them in the car oh, seat wow. without pain, let's talk about how you do that and figure out what your plan yeah, should be. Uh, such a great approach. I and mean, this is how you is how we found, you know, success as trainers was was focusing on those types of things, working on the person rather than necessarily the problem you know earlier you, you were talking about weekend warriors and i'd love your comment your your commentary on this or your opinion i i think a lot fundamentally people misunderstand exercise they don't realize that movement is a skill in other words someone says i want to start working out uh let me go lace up my running shoes and go running and they haven't really run since they were 10 so they go put their shoes on and what they don't do is think to themselves I never run. I probably don't know how to run anymore. They don't think that. They think I'm going to go run until I get tired mm -hmm. versus somebody who understands this is a skill. Let me go outside and practice running and get good at it and get the skill of it before I go run to fatigue and get tired. Is this a conversation you have to have with people? Yes, I think it's a really good um, conversation. And most importantly, again, it comes from understanding the person, right? Are they... if a patient would be like, um, I exercise a lot. I just go out running. I run like, you know, five times a week. I go out every morning and I run. And even if they're not running to fatigue and they're running 15, 20, 30 minutes, they're doing it every day, but they forget the point that exercising is slightly different from running because running, you're, you know, exercising your heart, but are mm -hmm. you actually exercising all the areas that should help you in running so you don't hurt your joints. Right. So what is the purpose of running? Running is helping your heart stay fit. <clears throat> running is helping your muscles stay warm. But if you're not running right, then you're tightening someplace, you're loosening someplace, and, and that could lead to increased joint stresses and can cause pain. Um, so yes, I think um, communicating with our patients that, um, you know, we never actually try to tell them to stop doing something. So if they are liking running and they're not hurting with running, right. please keep up because otherwise we lose them right there. Sure. And, you know, you don't want to lose your patients by telling them not to do something that they're having fun doing and they're not hurting doing. I'm God, not going to say don't Talk do about what a challenge that is. That's one of the hardest things as a trainer is like yeah. taking, knowing that you go, oh, this would be better for us, but this is something they love to do and they've been doing consistently. That fine dance that therapists and trainers have to be able to make is yeah. like, Getting them what they want, uh, what they what they should do <laughs> all the time. Now, what, now, now our battles, and, and we will get into you know more specifics about how the industry is being disrupted and you know kind of where you're coming from. But I do want to talk about the the clinical setting of physical therapy oh, as it is now, or as I should, I, sh I should say, as it is in the mainstream. There's a, there's a couple issues that I've had with it, 
in the past, which you've already actually addressed. Um, oftentimes I feel like, and I've had physical therapists that were phenomenal and I've had some experiences that were like, what's going on? They're not focusing, like you said, on the person, on me. And then I've had these experiences where they'll say, do these exercises and they're gone. And I'm doing this movement on my own or I have some, you know, kinesiology student watching me, for example, is also, there's also five other people who are doing exercises. I know as a trainer, when I take my eyes off a client for 10 seconds, they don't have the Mayhem awareness. Occurs. Yeah. yeah, they don't have the awareness. In fact, this was a selling point. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I used to do this thing with people where I, I do an assessment. I'd have them do a basic cable row and I would put them in proper position. I'd, you know, have the scapula retract and depress and they'd be like, oh my gosh, this feels real good. They would do two or three reps with me helping them. I'd take my hands off. They'd do two or three reps on their own and I'd show them on my phone when I'd film it. And I'd say, do you see how your form changed? But, and I literally left you alone for two seconds. And so when I saw this in that setting, I was like, this can't be this can't be good. Is this something that's going to be remedied or is this an issue that is being discussed? Of course, it's always discussed. And one of the things that as a physical therapist, we keep in mind is empowering our patients, mm -hmm. right? Um, our goal is to make a patient feel they can actually do it without us watching over them all the time. Mm. That is our goal because we can't keep them in physical therapy all the time. They're not going to be covered by insurance and right. be able to see them for six months or one year. And we don't have that privilege to do that. So our conversations with our patients are about making them talk about what they're feeling. Okay, can you tell me what you're feeling? How does this feel different from what you just did? And one really good example is about how we stand. Like when we're standing, is there weight on our entire foot or just the back of your foot or in the front of your foot? So having the patient actually, or a client actually talk about what are they feeling, let's maintain that, loading it to the level that the that's those small muscles that actually contribute in stabilization are able to handle. So there are larger muscles and there are smaller muscles. The smaller muscles are more, um, you know, filamented and then they have more stabilization role, whereas the larger muscles are actually the levers and they're actually doing the movement. So they need to work together. And if those stabilization muscles, you don't have the awareness for it, hmm. then you're losing that form. So as a therapist, what we're actually telling them is to focus on, okay, can you feel how this feels to retract your shoulder? Hmm. And we don't have to really retract too much, but just a little bit to set it on your body and on your rib cage. And then you need to maintain this. Can you do this with a yellow TheraBand or a yellow tube? And then, okay, I think you did it well. And then we do another set with a red, red tube and we do another set with a green tube. Getting them to connect. Yes. And then they will feel, oh my gosh, this green tube feels very hard and I can only hold that scapula for five time, for five counts. And so as a trainer, or as a therapist, I would say, okay, let's stick to red because I want your brain to train how to maintain this and do 15 of those with the red in a correct way before we move on to the green. So that's a progression as a therapist we would go through while the patient develops independence because we need them to do this at home every single day so that they retrain their brain right, on right. how to do it right. So since we're talking about clinics, <clears throat> I, I, I want to know I've, why different uh, different like private clinics have different ratios of DPTs, PTs, and kinesi students. I, I've experienced this enough times that there'll be this one clinic that will have, uh, you know, four DPTs and then the rest all PTs. And then there'll be one where there's only one DPT and then there's all PTAs. And, the, mm -hmm. and there, there's one that's all DPTs. Like, wh What a great question. Um, so... Are DPTs better than PTs, right? Um, so there are two ways of looking at that. Um, physical therapists um, had a master's degree for the longest time. So their, their acquisitions are PTs. Yeah. And in the last five or so years, we've now started having DPT programs, which is you get a doctorate of physical therapy in the first three years of training. So they are the newer generation of PTs who are all receiving doctorates. There are no more just PT programs. Oh, interesting. So one way of looking at it is I have a, I have a PT, you know, um, title. Uh, I don't have my DPT, but I have 15 years of work experience. Right. And here we have another DPT who has five years of work experience because that's the degree you receive when you are out of uh. school. However, there is a curriculum change, which is understanding red flags, understanding when you should be referring patients back to the physicians, um, understanding 
understanding pharmacology, understanding medical management, that has been formally added to physical therapy training oh, wow. very recently, which is which has enabled the doctorate title for physical therapists. Mm. Um, that also comes along with a transition in direct access, which we're going to talk in a second. So co now coming back to your question about the distribution in different yeah, clinics. Yeah, like why? why? Yeah. I think it depends on who suits that clinic environment. I think every clinic, every location comes with its motive. Are we treating, and, and you know, demographics that they're treating, right? Are we mainly treating um, patients from sports injuries? What kind of relationships I have with my physicians and my surgeons? Am I treating mainly pelvic floor physical therapy? Am I treating vestibular rehab? I'm dizzy and I kind of can't even drive to my you know, gym. So what kind of condition are we treating? What kind of therapist training do we have? That defines the different specialties between DPTs and PTs that have that experience in those fields. Difference between PTAs and PTs, I think that, um, again, I think it's a scaling question, right? Just the way we have teacher's assistance. We have teacher's assistance because the teacher can do everything, right. but there are certain things that are safe and well-trained and well-educated um, physical therapy assistants can handle, which is continuum of treatment. So the difference between a physical therapist and a physical therapy assistant is physical therapy assistants don't change the treatment plan. Yeah, They will follow the treatment plan established by a physical therapist. Mm, okay. Mm. Now, how many times in that situation though, is the you know owner of the clinic making that decision based off of the demographics that you talked about versus the monetary reasons for them? Because I imagine the business model. DPTs, PTs, PTAs, and Kines, you know students or whatever are all getting different pays. And is it a common practice for some of these clinics to, you know, maybe less about serving the client and more about serving my pocketbook of making sure that we make the most profits off of this? Is that common? It is common. It is common. But there are a lot of regulatory, a lot of compliance um, rules established by Medicare and in these insurance mm -hmm. payers that decrease poor practices. Um, I have worked in a clinic where I saw my patient for 20 minutes and I had my next patient in 20 minutes, but that patient would continue to do exercises with a physical therapy aid, right? So are you in that environment? Or then I went on to to Stanford where I was seeing my patients for 30 to 45 minutes and billing only for times that I was providing care for my patients. Quality was it as at its peak at Stanford. Right. We brought that to Luna, which is one-on-one -on -one time with your physical therapist in your home for 45 to 55 minute sessions and there are no physical therapy assistants, no aids. Um, so absolutely, does that decrease the number of time you actually need to go into PT because your therapist is monitoring you for a whole session? That's a good question. You hmm. know, maybe you recover with lesser number of visits and mm. you recover. Of course, that's no know? different than if you saw me with 20 years experience as a personal trainer and then I have my kid who's coming through school right now and maybe i just do the first session with you and then i say here now my kid's gonna take you the rest of the way through and even if he's a smart kid and the years of experience that i have yes. i know i could get that client to the result or their goal faster than sure and kid. i i actually think that a lot of the new grads come in with a lot of expertise a lot of clarity in their mm -hmm. approach because there's definitely upkeep in the curriculum and the training and the kind of internships and exposure mm -hmm. that we have so i'm not really um thinking that there is a I'm, I'm not always just saying that an experienced PT is always better than a DPT or a newly grad, but I do think that right training is so key. Um, and a therapist is responsible for the care of the patient, even if they're handing it off to a physical therapy assistant. So coming back to your point about when the clinic owners are making this a business over, um, you know, over actually knowing what is right for our patients, a therapist determines that. Yeah. If I think that this is care that somebody with chronic pain, for example, we know this has been going on for a long time. We're going to need to condition this patient to actually, before I change something, um, let's have a physical therapy assistant continue this program who can very, is very qualified to treat this patient. Let them do that. And as soon as the physical therapy assistant sees a need for transition, they're going to bring them back to a physical therapist update the program and move forward. So is that actually a compromise? Not always, but if you're making it a business, then that is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely as a patient, I would wanna ask, am I actually getting better here? 
that's yeah. the question. Yeah. I wouldn't really challenge um, it otherwise. Now you talked about uh, updates to the curriculum and DPTs and um, how has physical therapy evolved like over the years and what kind of other modalities and uh, other methods have been brought uh, you know, into therapy? Yeah, I think um, as a physical therapist, we always want to have a toolbox because we think that not one thing fits everybody. Um, so lots of different approaches, like even corrective exercises or progressive, uh, like progressive corrective exercises, um, you know, movement impairments are concepts. So there are lots of different approaches to care. And I think they've all evolved by improved education, improved curriculums, improved continuing education offerings to our our to us as therapists, um, absolutely going virtual, going remote, helps you start learning if those are your barriers to learn. So I think that's one. Uh, but there's so many things. How does... Um um, you know, how does restrictive blood flow <laughs> work and how does, oh, I'm yeah. not an expert at it, but mm -hmm. I would agree. Like, I think that there's so much, including cupping and including, you know, uh, resisting restrictive work, uh, blood flow and, um, you know, even utilizing corrective exercises and PRE exercises. How does all of that change your approach? And I think as a therapist, we're using those as toolkits as compared to mm. that is all how I treat. We love, mm. we love BFR mm. actually. In fact, I love love it for the physical therapy side more than the performance side, which is what is it's made its way actually into the fitness space as mm -hmm. kind of performance. Yeah, a great way to build muscle, but yeah. it's got great rehab applications. Yeah, and I didn't, I was Absolutely. not familiar with it as a trainer when I was in the training space. I found that we found that actually right when we first started the podcast, the very first episode, it was the first new bit of information or science that I brought to the podcast. I was experimenting with it. I had just heard about I think they were using it on like hockey players first to rehab them from injury, sports great. injuries. And it's just a great way for a, a trainer and coach who that makes gets a client from PT. They're now ready to strength train, but then we don't want to load too much yet. So to restrict that way and get similar benefits as loading it heavier was, I thought, yeah. incredible. You it know, is when, incredible. When we talked off air uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, there was an interesting statistic I wasn't familiar with, which is it, it was like a, per, a certain percentage of people stop their therapy after I think it was like three sessions and it was a large do you, do you remember that percentage what that was absolutely so it's pretty eye-opening actually because um what we've noted is 70 percent of patients actually when they start physical therapy they're motivated but they taper off and 70 percent of them don't complete their care they mm. prematurely stop going to the clinic they don't come back and fundamentally how wow. things work at a clinic are I'm gonna go in I'm gonna hear look at the receptionist telling me what is my schedule and what is the availability of the therapist? Okay, today I have an opening at 7 a.m. in the morning and another day I have an opening at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. As a normal human being, I'm working full time. I'm not able yeah. to accommodate that. So a lot of inconvenience kind of plays into that factor that we've noted. That's one concept. And then the other approach is also understanding not having a right therapist that educates you on what we are going to do next mm. and not having that vision built up in their recovery process can also be that the, the, the demotivator yeah. to continue. Yeah. I would imagine there's, there's uh, those roadblocks, right? I got to drive to the place, got to find this guy. That's always an issue. Yep. I think another one would be, um, I had this pain and the pain's kind of gone now I'm done. Uh, mm -hmm. and not realizing that there's more to do because the pain tends to be one of the last signals you get from your body and there's a lot of stuff you can do you know before that exactly and that's where i think that therapist communication becomes so critical like what are we working towards are you able to do that are you able to do your tennis swing are you able to put your kid in the car seat mm -hmm. are you able to do the heavy lifting that you wanted to do and telling them how it's going to progress like laying out the plan for them mm -hmm. um, and giving them some prognosis which is conditions like yours take about this much time and we don't have to see you two times a week for this entire or six months but I would like to see you two times a week for the first four weeks till you get to know what we're doing and then let's go down to once a week for another couple months and then maybe I'll see you once in two weeks for the rest of it and that's where I think there's a beautiful way to connect with personal trainers whether they're returning back to their activities but they continue to need the insight and the expertise mm. of a therapist um, so, so I recently I recently had a really interesting experience with therapy so my grandmother had a, a minor stroke lost some function on one side it was recommended that she get a therapist when it was appropriate. And my mother, my grandmother's, you know, she's in almost, she's in her eighties and she's 
old school immigrant Italian. No way in hell would she go to a clinic and work with someone. There's no way she'd go somewhere. But this therapist came to her house and she was actually very consistent because the therapist showed up, helped her at home, and we were all delighted that my grandmother, you know, once or twice a week was doing these exercises and in no way she would have ever done it if we had to drive her somewhere. What is home-based therapy? Like, what is this? And is this something relatively new? Is it disrupting the space? Um, well, I'm definitely sure from all our listeners and even from the people I know, so many resonate with that story where we have had a need. We haven't had the option to actually have physical therapy come home, but we actually get to experience it. We know how it is something that we need and it's easier to stick to and we're able to get better faster. Um, so it is very disruptive because there hasn't been an option like Luna before, which is outpatient physical therapy at home. And uh, there are a lot of benefits to that. So until today, if we talk a, a little bit about um, the history of it, there were home health agencies that are able to see patients right after an acute episode where you're able to see your patients at home. But that trend is changing. Luna's bringing outpatient physical therapy to patients at home, which is more cost effective. It's covered by your insurance um, and you're able to be seen in your environment, which is absolutely helpful. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that um, it is disrupting because there isn't um, an organization like Luna that is doing it at the scale. Today, we're in 19 different states and 32 metro markets across the country. And that's because patients need this. Patients understand the importance of physical therapy, physicians, health systems, um, doctors. Everybody mm -hmm. understands the importance of physical therapy. We know that, you know, 70% of the patients quit going to the clinics. When we did um, a major study um, or a, a major analysis with one of our health system partners, it was identified that 87% of the people that actually go to a clinic can be seen at home without compromising their quality of care. Wow. So if you can start receiving care sooner at your home, why procrastinate? Why wait to go to a clinic and drop off versus start PT yeah. with Luna? Are we seeing a, a better stick rate with this, with people having, I mean, I would assume for sure, but what, do you, what are you guys seeing? Absolutely. So even in terms of adherence to care, so that's a very important metric we look at at Luna, um, which is adherence to care. Um, did you drop off after three or four visits? Luna's average today is about 12 to 13 visits, which wow. is also very evidence-based. Um, if we are looking at uh, evidence-based care, because we don't, we're not really just seeing our patients more, we're seeing our patients more to actually see better completion <coughs> of care mm. and better outcomes. So when it comes to healthcare, we're looking at all of those things as well, that how is patient engagement, um, how is the actual technology driving better quality of care? Okay, um, so here's a big uh, question. And I know the answer because I asked you guys earlier, but I did not know this before. And I'm, I was really upset that I didn't because this would have been a huge roadblock. <laughs> Typically, when you get physical therapy, you got to go to your primary care physician. My knee hurts. Then they refer you to a physical therapist. Now your insurance- and Those options are limited. Yeah, they, they can, they can the insurance then approves it and then you're set and then you're good. And so I'm like, okay, well, why would- Boy, this is a big problem because Luna, which is the company that you're representing, which we think is the best in this particular space, they send people to your home, but they're disrupting a market that is that's largely being clinic based. Why would a a primary care physician refer to this this you know at home thing when they've been working with this? But what I learned from you guys, and correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have to get referred. If you have insurance, you can go straight to Luna, and your insurance will approve someone coming right to your house. Yes. Um, so that is one of the other things that's changing in the PT industry, which is direct access. So now with a lot of congressional activity, um, all 50 states in the country have some sort of direct accessibility, which is, um, for example, in the state of California, a patient can be seen for 12 visits or 45 days without a referral. Wow. Because there is a pr understanding that physical therapists when being the primary care providers are able to contain most of um, you know the injury or support a patient to the best possible and they're great at recognizing when this patient needs to maybe get an x-ray or needs to be referred back to the primary care physician 
or to an orthopedic doctor. Um, so that level of training and that level of trust in the healthcare team has come in where direct access is actually now a, a, a regulation, a state and federal wow. ability. So you know to how be, awesome to that is going to be for all of, I mean, we have such a large uh, personal trainer audience. And I know so many times where I'd get a client that was still battling something that I, it was just above my pay grade. I wasn't ready to, at that time in my career, to help that client figure out what was going on with their shoulder. They knew they had a problem hurting. I could tell by the way they moved, they weren't moving properly but how to address it and fix it. And if I could send them to a place without having to send them to their you know, their general practitioner to then refer them, to then yeah. go through all it, to be able to go directly to Luna and maybe hopefully work with them for four to six weeks to address it, fix it, and now they know, and then they come back and yeah. see me. So, so to, powerful. So to, so to be clear, uh, now physical PTs are being considered uh, primary care in the sense that they can refer. So they're the front line. So let's say I'm at home in that sense, right? Let's say I'm at home. And I'm like, man, my back hurts. Uh, I need to figure this out. I could go to Luna. Luna will send a PT to me who can then assess me and my insurance will cover treatment based on what the PT you know recommends. Or the PT could say, look, this is something you need to see an orthopod for and they can refer me in that direction. Yes, and referral in the healthcare system means different. We can't really write a prescription to send you somewhere. But yes, we are basically identifying if this is within the scope of our practice. So as a licensed therapist, I know what I can treat. So when the moment is where I can't treat this, I'm going to tell you to go to your doctor. Wow. Um, so that is ethical practice and it's under our license. And, you know, we are we're bound to our licenses. Um, so, yes, I mean, there is a lot of trust. Um, when you go to a doctor, they're going to write a prescription for physical therapy that says low back pain. But is your low back pain coming from a potential disc irritation or is it coming from a facet joint irritation right. or is this a neuromuscular limitation or a neurological tension? The therapist is determining that. And so we're doing like PT diagnosis. We're not really saying you have spondylolisthesis or you have a disc herniation. A therapist would never do that because those are medical diagnoses. But we know what's causing you the limitation or the restriction in your functional movements. Wow. And we're treating that. Interesting. And covered by insurance. This is the part mm -hmm. that blew me away the most. The second thing that I think is fascinating is when you go to a clinic, we just described kind of what typically happens in a lot of clinic clinics. The PT gives you the program and then there's a PTA that kind of watches you and maybe they're watching four different people. So you're spending maybe 15 to 20 minutes with the, you know, the main, you know, physical therapist. When people come to your home, like with Luna, is it just you and them and that's it? And they stay with you the, basically the entire time? That is absolutely it. Um, so as you said before, if I have low back pain, I can call Luna. Luna can send out an experienced, skilled therapist who is trained in orthopedics to be your play to you know to provide care to you it's covered by insurance it'll be a one on one 45 to 55 minute session with just your therapist and of course, you have the Luna technology. So we have an amazing Luna patient app, which when the therapist provides exercises, you could actually use the workout program in oh, the great. Luna app. Oh, wow. Um, and then if the therapist says, do your exercises three times a week, you're actually seeing if your patient did them three times a week or did they do them wow. once a week? Mm -hmm. So you know what's realistic for your patient. Yeah. Wow. wow, that's interesting. Now, is okay, uh, is this like way more expensive then? Because if I have someone like that with me for 45 minutes versus you know, two or three people watching, you know, 10 people do extras. It, it's got to be a lot more expensive or is there, were there a lot of things that were cut out, a lot of middlemen that made up that difference? Like, how does that work? You're setting up for amazing answers from me. <laughs> um, that's what well, I mean, that's are, what I would wonder, you know, yes, I'd be like, what am I, yes. this must be so much more expensive. Yeah. Yes, because the, the hard to believe truth is it's magical because there is no added cost to a patient to get care in this manner, to have a therapist in your home, to have an application that monitors you when you're not in PT, to have an application where you can actually chat with your therapist even between your treatment sessions. All of this comes free, but wow. no, it's um, but it's basically healthcare. It's great care. Um, our goal was to actually bring good quality care outside the four walls of a clinic because that improves access. Access is one of the biggest problems in physical therapy. It's not doing an annual visit once a year with your primary care physician. Right. It's seeing your patient two times a week for six weeks, 12, 15, 20 sessions. Um, are you actually going to 
make that, you know? And um, so I think it's really, really important that you're able to stick to it, you're able to return to your function, and you're not giving up on it. Yeah, another question is, and, and, and I know the answer to this because I know what's uh, what is typically required for rehab or for correctional exercise, but the average person may be listening and thinking, I don't have equipment at my home, so how can they possibly help me You know, when I, I don't have all this machines or things to work with. Now, I know with rehab, it's very you don't need much. You need bands and uh, may, maybe body weight and a chair or something like that. So is it can you effectively treat someone at home without lots of fancy equipment? So that's where that statistic, about 87% of the patients that go to an outpatient Got clinic it. can benefit from at home. But that doesn't mean that there is no fancy equipment. There is equipment, which actually is something you can do even when you're not at a gym or when you're not uh, in a PT clinic. So the most important thing is how do our patients get empowered to do something even after physical therapy, right? So if I discharge them, I still want them to keep up with their program. So we're basically, therapists are bringing in this entire toolkit. It has all the assessment tools that they need to do your assessment. It has treatment tools like TheraBands, TheraLoops, uh, some proprioception training materials, but those are portable things. You, as a patient, if you're going to a hotel room for work, you're still able to take your things with you. Okay. So you're tailoring the program to what a patient needs. A therapist brings in a treatment table. So you're not being treated on a bed or on a couch or on the floor. You're actually being treated in a professional workspace on a treatment table. Um, you are receiving infection control practices with COVID that has become super important. Mm. Um, so all of that is done legitimately. Uh, th and the way we kind of put it is the clinic comes home. You're not going to the clinic. Mm. So we're maintaining all of those. That's a good um, point. Benefits. With That was a very good point with the with COVID because that's changed. Um, it's changed the environment so significantly that there are probably people who've are afraid of going, especially if they don't think it's necessary. Like, eh, my knee hurts, but it's not super bad. So I don't want to go to the clinic with lots of other people. It, so I'm assuming that this particular environment has probably only boosted the popularity of in-home services. Am I am I correct or is it? Well, um, I would say we've been longer than the COVID. So okay. uh, patients had already started recognizing this benefit. We're moving in this industry, uh, in this world where everybody wants good quality care while it's convenient and convenience was never focused on before however it is delaying receiving care so how do we improve access so luna started um, um patient care in 2018 and of course COVID stuck more so like last year definitely increase in understanding and need we've supported so many surgeons who couldn't do elective surgeries and how do we maintain our patients pain levels, how do we maintain their recovery, how do we help them um, sustain their ability while they're waiting for their surgeries to happen. So definitely a huge uptake. Um, we've expanded significantly um, in the Bay Area. Um, we, def we have about 10% of outpatient physical therapists that actually now work for Luna, um, wow. which is huge. That's because a lot. Therapists love it. They love the ability to see their patients in the home and patients absolutely love it because they don't want to delay care if there is a great offering like Luna. Now, what does it take for a physical therapist to become a Luna practitioner and, um, and how does that benefit their current practice? Like, is this something that, you know, they could do in conjunction with their, uh, clinic? Yeah. Um, Home-based care isn't necessarily new. There has always been home health agencies. It's just that we weren't really supporting active population or we weren't really supporting outpatient population, which is just how the, the business is structured um, or the offering is structured. But um, the most important thing to think about as a therapist is how am I getting exposure to different upcoming innovative solutions? For Luna, it was really important how our therapists experiences because as clinicians, and this happens in all clinical world. As clinicians, we are doing a lot of administrative work and we're doing a lot of clinical work and we're doing everything. We're staying hours and hours after actually seeing our patients to get all of that stuff done. So at Luna, it was really important for us to make sure our therapists are able to stay focused on what they do best, which is patient care. Um, in order for therapists, yes, so therapists can work at a clinic. In fact, 
all of um, more than 95% of therapists at Luna are moonlighting with Luna, hence the name Luna. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. So they're doing from. this um, for supplemental income. But um, there is a lot that goes into it to maintain consistency in care. So, yes, outpatient therapists, most of Luna therapists are three plus years of work experience. We actually have 10.5 years of average work experience of the wow. therapists on the platform. We don't have new grads. We don't have... Um, students we don't have physical therapy assistance so if you are a licensed therapist with outpatient pt experience who can be successfully treating independently not being in a clinic mm-hmm. environment you're fit for luna okay. now you mentioned paperwork and i remember mm. talking to you guys a little bit about that like some some of the benefits you provided in terms of lightening that load somehow what does that look like yeah pts hate that yeah it's like a, it's there's like, a like, like an hour of paperwork for each patient after. wow that's a lot when it comes from you know personal trainers we've worked uh, with I'm a sure lot of you therapists all have heard of yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the pt scribbling about that but uh yes burden of documentation is absolutely well known so that's what I think uh, we did really well, which is focus on the therapist experience. Um, we recently did a stat where um, at Luna, we've developed this process called auto charting. It's voice enabled. Um, so a therapist can actually finish a documentation in eight minutes versus 30 what? minutes that I did at a clinic um, or three minutes for a standard visits where it would take me like 15, 20 minutes. Um, so. It saved us a lot of time, and we yeah. recently did an under, uh, a look at it, and it was enough time to go to Mars and come back. So, do you want to, do you want to join that group? Do you want to be saving time in documentation and enjoying patient care? So, therapists absolutely love so it. Are it's they just magical. they just speak into the app? Is that what it is? Yes, and you know, uh, to make anything simple goes a lot of work. So, yeah. I don't want to undermine how not comprehensive this is because it's a very comprehensive documentation system. But for a therapist, it's as simple as, okay, I have a visit uh, with Adam. I'm going to come. I'm going to start my session. So it starts actually geographically looking at where I am. It's making sure that you're actually at your patient's home. Yeah. I finish my session, and then I'm driving to my uh, next patient's visit. And I click a button. I get an interview. I'm prompted questions. I answer those questions. And by the time I go home at night or wake up the next morning, my chart's already ready for me. I can edit all of that and sign off on it. And the way we're also driving behavior is as soon as you sign off on that chart, you're getting paid for that visit. So you now don't have to wait for your two-week check to come in. Mm. You're actually getting paid as soon as you sign off. So oh, in, the- wow. so in theory, amazing. could I do this as a, a – could I be try p- 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 pretending I'm a physical therapist? Could I go to a patient's house and then – set myself up to go to another patient's house on the way from this patient, this patient, I could be recording all that stuff. Can that be done? That can be done. And it only takes you eight minutes. So, or three minutes. Wow. Well, okay, so you know, if I if I'm <laughs> so I'm gonna th- from the PT's perspective, right? So I normally work in a clinic. I see this new company. I like the fact that I could spend more time with my patient, but I gotta drive. I'm going from person to person. Am I getting compensated for all of this? Am I making more or less? Is it competitive? Like, what does that look like for me as a, as a therapist? It definitely has a higher earning potential to work with Luna um, because we're paying by the visit. Wow. Um, However, there is a difference in how outpatient gets reimbursed. And so there, Luna definitely uh, pays therapists really well, well compared to a clinic. Um, when you think about drive times, that's where Luna technology comes in. We're not really expecting our patients to, our, our therapists to spend an hour and a half to see one patient, right? So it's really important that their drive times are maintained within 30 minutes from one patient to another. And that's where we increase the capacity and density of the patient population where they live. So they're not really driving back and forth across town or spending the entire day just seeing three or four patients. It's about how you leverage technology to restrict your time, um, you know, driving. Um, how do you ensure you save time documentation so that you're not going home and then documenting and not getting paid for it? Um, how do you have an amazing administrative concierge team supporting you so you're not now calling the doctors, trying to figure out paperwork? So how do you solve that documentation burden, administrative burden, which really makes a sweet spot to get what you get paid for that visit for for a Luna therapist? Holy well, isn't, and, and isn't that like the secret sauce of Luna? Like I think I remember talking to Matt and don't you guys, didn't you guys acquire someone from Luna on the team? I mean, excuse me, from Uber who actually did all the geolocation and stuff? That is true. So uh, one of our, so our CTO um, is from Uber. Oh. And of course he's, he's a mastermind behind the matching and the routing. So it's not just geographical location, but we're now looking at, is this therapist or orthopedy? Is this, 
a neuro PT? Is this a vestibular PT? Mm. What does a patient need? What is their time availability? What's the therapist time availability? Wow. What's their drive time going to be from one patient to another? Are they going to get back home without driving 45 minutes? So, so many amazing components. And of wow. course, I think we have a really awesome uh, CTO to do yeah, that for I, us. I mean, okay, so everything you're explaining, right? So you get someone to your house, which that's a big difference. Uh, people are going to adhere to it longer because of that. It's much more convenient. Therapists make more money, do less paperwork. I can't imagine something more disruptive to the market. Are people upset? Like, are you are you guys making other like uh, like other organizations upset, or is this something that everybody's starting to adopt? Because I can't see how you would compete against that. Well, we want people to be upset. Okay. Right? Because that means we're doing that something. That was our goal, too. Like yeah. We'd be good yeah. friends. Because, we, because we want them to not be super comfortable. It's You're never making innovation when it's something everybody can accept the very first time you see it. So it's okay. We're, we're okay with people being upset. And it starts with at the, the most bottom level, right? Um, when a therapist is referring a patient over to a personal trainer or a massage therapist, and a massage therapist is sending a patient to a therapist you're always thinking okay am i going to lose my patients right. am i going to have less patients in my clinic or if you know why wouldn't everybody want luna absolutely why wouldn't everybody want luna there's a lot of questions mm. that would arise so um there is definitely disruption because of that but is it not challenging it is very challenging to build what luna has built it's not an easy problem to solve so i think we have a lot of amazing support we have a lot of amazing support from all the partners at luna um, we have health system partners we have orthopedic group partners we have individual more than 2,000 physicians who love luna and refer to luna today so i think we need both we mm -hmm. need people who are upset and we need people who love us <laughs> well so um, so something that i've noticed a lot just you know being in the in the space the health space for uh, over two decades um i've noticed more than ever uh children with posture deviations and pain i know kids i read a statistic i don't remember what the exact percentage but you know, if you were a, a doctor, you probably, you know, 20 years ago, you rarely ever saw kids show up with low chronic low back pain or neck pain. Now you're seeing that quite a bit. Do you guys also work with, with children for things like forward head and shoulder pain and back pain? And is, is this is this starting to grow? Are you guys seeing more of this? You know, um, I think that's where is the amazing thing, which is the potential and the opportunity is so huge. Luna sees patients from 13 to 103, right? So it sees the whole spectrum. We don't see patients below 13 years of age today. Mm -hmm. Could we? Yes, we could, but our focus is 13 and over. Um, and yes, I think that awareness, that education, athletic trainers, re like coaches, um, all of those um, opportunities where we identify, send these patients or send these children um, this population to actually receive care sooner than later because they're sitting in front of the computers and then they're going and playing PE and soccer for like an hour. They have postural deviations, they have forward head, they have um, lengthened nerves and they have lack of, you know, phasic and tonic muscle balances. So how are we actually being proactive? Education is never going to end. There's so much evidence, even though WHO identified that there's underutilization of physical therapy. Um, so how do we actually improve awareness amongst all of these people? So yes, we can absolutely see those people, those um kids and we would love to see those yeah. kids because that's where you what start you, the change. It's a huge market because as a parent, you got three kids, you got your child who you're like, man, that his neck is not, you know, he's not moving it right. He's got a forward head. I can see some problems. He has a little bit, but I got to take him to the clinic and I got these other kids instead of being like, just come to the house. I'm going to be with the other kids over here. You guys do your thing. That's got to be like an exploding market, I would imagine. Yes, one of those exploding markets, but <laughs> absolutely. Um, definitely a great opportunity. We have a lot of parents doing that. You sprained your ankle after a soccer practice. Don't mm. procrastinate that. Don't just ice it. Take care of it. Let's figure out how to get it stronger because we want you to continue playing soccer. How do you do that? So, 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 so the process would be instead of taking my kid to the doctor to have it looked at, I could call you guys tell you guys, listen, my kid uh, sprained their ankle playing soccer, then we'd set up an appointment and someone would come and do the and do the initial assessment there. That is correct. Oh, wow. That makes yeah. a huge... And it'll be covered by your insurance. That makes a huge difference. Okay, so what kind of people then should seek out physical therapy? Aside from the obvious, like I had knee surgery or 
I've got major pain. Like what are what are some areas that are that are common that maybe people aren't super aware of that they probably would benefit from from physical therapy? Right. Well, uh, I would say don't wait to be injured. Okay. If you're having aches and pains, you're having uh, lack of ability to do what you want to do best. If you're a golfer and if you can golf and your swing's not great and you're having some shoulder pain, see a physical therapist. Um, if you're having low back pain sitting from working all day long, go see a physical therapist. Mm. If you're having neck pain and which hasn't gone away for 10, 15 days, see a physical therapist. So the earlier you see a therapist, your prognosis is better. There's a higher chance you're going to get better without needing x-rays and without needing medication. And internally, you always have this fear of wanting more medical care. I'm paying for my insurance. I should get an x-ray. I should get an MRI. I should get this. I'm paying for this. Um, I think we need to shift away from that and actually do something ourselves, take charge of our care. And actually, even though it's not as easy as taking pills, we need to invest you, in our own body. You know what the irony of it is, is it, let's say you're listening and you're like, cool, I'm going to have a therapist come to my house and help me. So now my insurance is going to pay more. The reality is insurance will end up saving money in the long run because it's much, it's, it's much cheaper to treat chronic low back pain through exercise than it is to have to do surgery later on. So that's the irony. It's actually, sa it'll actually Preventive save methods. money. Yeah. Then you think it's saving it's more, everybody money on both ends. That's, that's what I'm saying. Doing. Everybody saves money as a result of, of doing things right. So I have a, a, an uncle. I was having this conversation with him the other day. I'm like, we need to do some correctional exercise. He's like, why? I don't hurt. But I was watching him put on his shoes and he has to put them on really in a weird way. He's got to like sit down and use his finger and he's got like really bad movement. I'm like we got to do some correctional exercise. Why? Who cares? I can still put my shoes on. Like these are, these are simple things that I <laughs> You're think You're not people... supposed to be sweating though and taking 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you don't have to take, you shouldn't I'm have to take your shirt off. You don't have to take a break. Right. Yeah. You shouldn't have to take a break uncle from one shoe to the other yeah, shoe. <laughs> but you know, or sitting down and having to, you know, twist your leg. Like these are things that I think people don't realize that they could benefit from therapy. Like if you used to be able to put one sock on while standing and now you have to sit down because you're losing your balance or, you know, it's hard for you to tie your shoes or you used to be able to reach up to the top of something and now you can't really reach it because you can't fully extend, even though you may not, you may not feel pain that those people would benefit greatly. In fact, I would make the argument that those are the best people because it's before they hurt. Absolutely. And before they deteriorate or continue to stay away from things that they could be actually doing, staying independent, right? So today we're able to put the shoe on, but tomorrow you actually might need a shoe, shoe hook. And the day after that, you actually might need a caregiver to help you with your shoe. So how could you actually not you know, postpone that. So um, you mentioned something else just at, you know, in passing about pelvic floor rehab. This one's really important to me now because I've, I've dived a little deeper in this because we, my wife had a baby about 10 months ago and so many women do not understand the symptoms of poor pelvic floor muscle strength, especially after having a baby. Like it is so important that if you have a baby that you, you do some type of pelvic floor exercise afterwards, otherwise you could end up with the chronic issue. I remember when I was an early trainer, this is when I was like 20. So imagine my shock when I had a client try and do jumping jacks. She's like, no, I can't do them. Why? Uh, I, I end up peeing myself a little bit. I remember I was 20 years old. I'm like, what? Yeah. That's okay, what the hell's going on here? So like how important is, is therapy post normal things? Like I just had a yeah. baby. I think uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. The more and more people know about this, it's great. So thanks for asking that question because it's very important to be just aware mm -hmm. of your muscles, to be aware of how you could be doing things, how you could be compensating things. You're weak, so you bend a different way. You're not fully recovered, so you're actually lifting things wrongly or overloading your muscles. So I think it's really, really important after normal things like birthing um, that you're able to pay attention to yourself. And there is no way a newborn baby's mom is going to be able to go into a clinic. Definitely. So that's, that's another amazing thing. Just even six sessions of becoming more aware. How do you identify where your core is after giving childbirth? Or where are the small muscles in your sacrum and your lower back and your, you know, your core stabilizers and re engaging those um, in order to have that stability that holds your upper body and your lower body together another exploding market like you were talking about yeah. i think it's super underutilized because there hasn't been a convenient offering to have care like that and it's also a niche practice there are not as many pelvic floor therapists yes. out there so yeah. when you actually find a great pelvic floor therapist 
pay attention to yourself. Yeah. What about sure. like fitness enthusiasts? So somebody's listening. I'm like, I work out all the time. I really fit. Um, but you know, I stopped deadlifting a while ago because it just tends to bother my back. So I don't do that anymore. Or I just stop squatting. I do other leg exercises. So I don't squat anymore because it bothers my knee. Is that, are those, could, are those people going to benefit from working with a therapist? A hundred percent. As I said, you know, as a, as a trainer, you might say, okay, let's not do this exercise because it's hurting. But as a therapist, I might say, let's figure out why you can this, can't do this exercise. Because if we're telling our patients don't do this, then we're not doing our job because we need to figure out why they're not able to do this and help them get back to that or help them navigate that. So one really good example is sciatica, right? What is sciatica? Yeah. Sciatica is actually a symptom, but is the sciatica coming from your lower back? Is it coming from an impingement? in your muscle or is it com coming from like a nerve tension yeah. mm -hmm. you know you need a physical therapist to help you guide to it so that now you're not hurting every time you bend and do a deadlift or you're bending over and coming up wrong so if you have stayed away from a deadlift you absolutely want to say, see your therapist because if you're so fit figuring out where is that muscle imbalance would be perfect to help you get back to it. And you have a reason, where, which is why you need skilled physical therapy. Wow, excellent. So I have one last question for me, and it's a personal question. I'm okay. just curious, because we didn't talk about this off air there. Uh, did Luna find you, or did you find Luna? And what Ooh. was like the, I mean, you had been learning all this stuff, just like we are for the first time, and there was something that went, holy shit, I'm in, or whatever. Um, wow, that is a that is a pretty personal question. <laughs> but um, I think we found each other because um, like soulmates. <laughs> yes, I would 100% agree. I, I do get told at um, at at Luna often that I have purple blood in me. So um, so yes, I think um, it was perfect timing. I was at Stanford, really enjoying I grew a lot. I was tra um, I was co lecturing for residency programs. And I was, um, um, you know, a senior physical therapist getting trained in a lot of different innovative approaches to care and you are in this feeling where I don't necessarily know it all am I like good enough but then it comes a point where you're like okay no I do know a lot I want to bring this to a larger number of people and that's where when I um, met the CEO of Luna the conversation was am I a therapist at Luna no I think I definitely want to take a take on helping this at scale, bringing the quality at scale and leveraging technology to do this at scale. So I was in, in a transition of starting my own practice and that could keep me limited to like five therapists, 10 therapists, a few different clinics. Uh, but doing this across 19 states, 32 markets, 1,200 therapists on the platform today has been an incredible opportunity. Excellent. Awesome, so awesome. most most big city metropolitan areas, would you say, is where people will have access? Yeah, if we go to getluna.com, there is a coverage map across the nation and um, we have a phone number you can call Luna you would get um, informed if you have a therapist available in your market we can verify your benefits before you start care so there are no surprises on how much you actually pay a copay um, a patient doesn't pay anything extra um, as compared to if they were to go to a clinic so if you go to a clinic and forty dollars is your copayment, that would Same be your copayment. Wow! Um, yeah, so I, I predict this to explode uh, unless there's some weird law that comes out to prevent you know <laughs> what you guys are doing. But I can't see this not completely taking over because uh, there's absolutely no the therapist makes more. They have mm -hmm. to do less paperwork. The patient gets better care. Uh, so Everybody I wins. Mean, yeah, that's yeah. why we wanted you on because this is uh, exceptional. Very disrupting. I can't think of the last time I've. Felt like something, uh, you know, as established as PT got is going to get this disrupted. So, very cool. That's really exciting to hear. And along with all the business side, as a clinician, I just feel um, there is a space for everything. There's a space for digitization of of care, but there is a space where in person care is going to help you solve your problem. And so, don't think that one thing can replace another. Start taking care of yourself. If you need a PT in home, there is an amazing opportunity like this for sure. Excellent, great. great message. Thank you very much. Yeah.